things like the violas and pansies, uh, cool season vegetables. I see a little ball of mixed lettuce here. So those of you that are um, getting an early start on your vegetable gardening, like I said, you know, potatoes, uh, asparagus roots. Uh, like I said, we're getting some of the, the greens like spinach and kale and uh, lettuce and all this kind of stuff in. And you can actually start on that. I know it gets cooler next week, but these are plants that are cold tolerant. Um, and so if you want to get jump on things, come in and see us. But as uh, Sally mentioned, what I'm going to spend really most of my time, and not much, I'm going to just take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about lawns and taking good care of our lawns. Uh, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So send questions in. Sally's going to monitor all that. And uh, we're going to take 45 minutes to go through this. Also, as you know, I'm kind of getting sick and tired of the PowerPoint thing. So we're going retro today. And I'm going to begin with my slides here. So I hope you guys can see this. This is, um, to me, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous, tall fescue, bluegrass lawn. This, a lot of times, is the type of lawn, the type of garden that we might envision for ourselves. Uh, and what I'd like to start out with an understanding, so you realize, tall fescue and bluegrass, these are what we call cool season grasses. So their optimum, ideal growing conditions are when temperatures are hovering right in about 55 to 75 degrees, it's getting one inch of rain per week. Um, that's when we get this beautiful, um, gorgeous, dark green, dense lawn that's in there. Uh, now I will, in terms of full disclosure mention though, I took this picture up in Michigan, right? Because if you go up to Michigan in the middle of summer, as I did several years ago, hey, their weather stays in that 55, 75 degrees, um, and we can get gorgeous, beautiful lawns like that. But keep that in mind. Let's see, I'll go to my next slide. Very good there. And here's what um, I'm really gonna spend a little bit of time for you with this chart, because this will tell you everything you need to know about your turf. So, what I have here is this green line that you can see is representative of the vegetative growth, the above ground. This is what we actually see our lawn doing. If you were to look below ground in the roots, that's my red line. This is what's happening below ground. And the blue line is to represent the stored carbohydrates. So plants store energy in the form of carbohydrates and with grass plants particularly, that energy is stored in the crown and in the roots of the plant. So this story begins actually late last summer. Let's go back to sort of that August, September time period last summer, um, late summer, early fall. Think of the days getting shorter, the temperatures getting cooler. And what happens is under those conditions, the plant, your lawn actually initiates a little flower bud. Now nobody thinks about their lawn as a flowering plant, but it absolutely is. And so last fall on the short days and the cool temperatures, it produced a little flower bud. And so all through the winter at September, October, November, into December time period, your lawn is building and storing carbohydrate reserves and it's building all that stored energy down in the root system. This brings us right up to today. We're now right here on the curve in this early spring time period. And what's going to happen is as the days are getting longer, as the temperatures are getting warmer, it's like flipping a switch. And your plant, your lawn, is going to go into its flowering stage, its reproductive stage. So as we start moving into early April, mid-April, it's going to suddenly jump like this, right? This is your grass where it starts growing and you feel like, you know, oh my God, I just mowed it yesterday and it needs to be mowed again. This is happening kind of through mid-April, um, mid-May, and it reaches its peak right here in that middle part of May. And what the plant is doing is it's going into its flowering stage. You know, you're looking at it saying, oh, the lawn is green, it's lush, it's growing, um, going like gangbusters. But what's happening is all that energy, all that stored carbohydrate that that plant has been developing over the winter 
that is now being channeled into vegetative growth above ground. And like I said, that hits its peak in, um, in right at mid-May. You can see this just the last three days where we suddenly kind of jumped up into temperatures where it's been 70 degrees. And the first time I've seen the sun, I can say in, in at least a few weeks, in months, it seems like, um, and you see your plant, your lawn responding to that by greening up also. So that's gonna continue uh, based really just on the vegetation how it goes. So this is really just, it's important to me that you understand what the plant's doing, how it's interacting with its environment and where we fall in terms of its growth cycle because everything that we do, everything that we do in terms of managing our lawn and garden is trying to work with the natural growth cycle of the plant and with the weather and the conditions that we have. That I will go to my next slide. They won't change. Oh, there I got it. A little technical difficulty in that one. Uh, so with that kind of background in mind, what happens, that picture you were just looking at, that was taken up here and what over here, Charlotte Boy, Michigan, up in up in uh, up there in the tip of Michigan there. So when we're up here in this part of the country, in this region, this is where our cool season grasses thrive. Remember, 55, 75 degrees an inch of rain. They've got beautiful lawn up here. That's why Scotts is located in Ohio and everything's beautiful there. If you're down here in the Southern region of the country, a lot of you are growing warm season grasses. Uh, those are things like Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass. Um, even sometimes like some of us grow uh, zoysia grass. Warm season grasses are the flip side of that. They love hot, dry weather. They are happy as a clam when it's, you know, 85, 95, 100 degrees out. Where we live, right here in Northern Virginia, this transition zone where Northern and Southern climates overlap and we can get cold, wet winters and we get hot, dry summers. This is a particularly challenging area for us to grow because we're growing cool season grasses um, and as we move into the summertime, that's when they get stressed, they get a little weak and the problems show, show up. But really the best grasses for most of this is going to be uh, primarily tall fescue, uh, which gives us the heat and drought tolerance that grows in full sun, part shade, and that's what most of us are growing. All right, and that's slide. I have to check the batteries in this one sometime. Uh, so this kind of brings us up and sort of summarizes some of the points I've been making. So what happens, right? Here we are, late March, going into April. Uh, things aren't really growing yet, but, but we're getting there. We're just starting to see early signs of green up. As we start hitting into April, that's when you see your grass really starts growing. Uh, if you look at average temperatures in May, so here we are kind of in May, we kind of, we're still at that 70 degree average. We're still getting about three and a half inches of rain per week. Uh, and so in April and May, you're sitting there, you're patting yourself on the back, you're looking at the grass. You've been watching some of these things, you seminars and these Zoom meetings, you did your fall fertilizing and stuff. And you're thinking like, wow, you know, this thing is rocking. This is looking good. So everything's going beautifully in May. We kind of start moving to June, what happens? Well, we're starting to creep up here to 78 degrees. Now your grass is starting to get a little bit stressed out, a little bit of weakness. And then we start hitting into 85, 86 degrees as we go into July, August, September. This is way out of the uh, comfort zone for your lawn. And that's when we start seeing it thins out, loses density, um, all weeds start moving in and everything kind of starts to go a little haywire. My point in telling all this to you is that we need to be taking steps now, steps that we're taking today, so our lawn is better prepared when we start to hit this stress time. So that brings us up today, and I think that's about my final slide. Um, I'll clear that away. So along with this, um, what I really emphasize to everybody, it's kind of my approach. There's no, there's no one answer for everything and everybody's gonna find their kind of their, what works best for them. But things that I'm encouraging you to really be thinking about right now, 
to me, everybody, pretty much everybody out there needs to be thinking about getting a weed preventer down. Okay. Because as I'm talking about your grass lying there, waiting for things to warm up and start growing, there are also dormant weed seeds. You think of things like crabgrass, stilt grass, um, Lespedeza, spurge. These are all summer annual weeds. Those seeds are sitting on the ground in the soil. And as those soil temperatures start to warm up, they begin to sprout. So the real thought is people are coming in now and buying and applying a weed preventer. When you apply a weed preventer, what we're doing is we're putting down a barrier on the lawn, a chemical barrier that sits there and these berries is gonna last for maybe eight to 12 weeks. And as that weed seed starts to germinate, it comes in contact with that, um, with that pre-emergent weed control and prevents that weed seed from being able to get established. So there's several different ones that you can choose. This is the one that I'm gonna say is probably most applicable for most of you that are out there. So what we're selling is the preen uh, crabgrass control right here. This works on crabgrass, but also about 25, 35 other weeds. So it's broad spectrum in terms of it prevents uh, several different both grassy and broadleaf summer annual weeds. To me, the time to apply this, the ideal time is let's say about March 15 to April 15. I really like to get it down, you know, maybe before May gets here. Because right now our soil temperatures are still cool, the weed seeds have not started to germinate, but you're going to get this down sometime during the next month to prevent those weeds from showing up later this summer. Now this specifically goes after uh, crabgrass, like I said, stilt grass and some of those grassy type weeds. If you have more of an issue with broadleaf weeds, um, let's say something like dandelions, so this product, the, um, the broadleaf weed control with gallery that I'm showing, this works specifically on broadleaf weeds. So it's, I sometimes call it more of a specialty product where you can use one, you can use the other, you can do them in combination, really just depending on what you're after. But again, this is something you want to do in the next month. So that's weed prevention. That's just maintaining what we already have going. Now, the next thing I would tell you is if you want to, Fertilize your lawn, and these things are compatible with each other. If you say, "Hey, you know, I, you know, you take a lot of pride in this and a lot of enjoyment with it, and you also want to fertilize your lawn to get a little green up in there and get it growing," um, then I'm going to suggest that we put the Miracle Premium on here. This lawn. Um, this also comes. We always we package this in small sizes, uh, so if you have a small lawn. Something that does about uh, 1,700 square feet, as well as something like this does 5,000 square feet. Um, this again is something. There's no urgency. I'm just kind of planting these ideas. You can start on it today if you want to. This weekend, you can wait four weeks, six weeks, but sometime during that time frame, we want to take advantage of the cool weather and get things going with that. And I feel like I'm showing you a lot of products here today, uh, but hopefully you're taking notes. And that's basically to prevent weeds and get green up um, of your lawn going. The other part of this is if you have weeds, these things I've shown you, they don't actually kill weeds. Um, a lot of people are starting to see things like chickweed and bittercress bloom in their yard. These are cool season weeds. These are ones that are growing now. They're actually beginning to flower with the nice weather. Um, and if, if you have those and you want to get rid of them, instead of doing a weed preventer, we need to be talking about doing a weed killer. Uh, several good ones out there. Um, the sprays work better than the granules. This is one that I do like. It's called Trimec, um, this Trimec Speed. The speed basically means that it's going to be more effective and it's going to last or it's gonna be more effective and work quicker than some of the other options that are out there. This particular weed killer, we can use at temperatures as low as 40 degrees. So sometimes in the spring, when we have these cooler temperatures, uh, I think this is a good route to go there. So basically I'm out there saying, hey, um, number one, let's talk about getting, putting something down to prevent weeds in your lawn. Number two, um, you can 
um, fertilize. Again, this is really based on what your expectations are in terms of lawn quality and what your personal situation is. And if you need to kill weeds, uh, we can also get on top of that. So that's kind of my little intro. And I just see, so we have any any questions? That yeah, we, we've got a lot coming in. Um, so I'm gonna start with, we have a lot on specific weeds and product recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna start with the ones that are, cover more general concepts. And then if we have time, we'll get into the specific weeds. Um, so if we don't get to your question today, please feel free to follow up. Um, you can email me, send us a Facebook message or um, contact us at the store. So the first question is, are these chemicals ideal for a bird-friendly yard? So, um, excellent question. Again, this kind of quick, quick sort of overview. We we'll gave a kind of a long-winded answer to it, though, because uh, I always like to say, first of all, everything I'm telling you here is just optional. Um, when I showed you that picture, that beautiful, uniform, dense, dark green, weed-free lawn, um, that's you have to decide if that's the level of lawn that you want to achieve, if that's the kind of quality that you want to have, then you're pretty much going to end up having to use some of these products that are out there. The biggest, toughest issue is in terms of weed management, because we have organic fertilizers, um, you know, we've got organic pest controls, uh, where it gets a little tricky comes in with weed management. So first thing I'm going to say is, hey, if you can live with the weeds, I can live with that, that's kind of a choice that goes out. In terms of being a pet friendly, you know, bird friendly, wildlife friendly, all of these things I'm talking about, um, you're going to use following the label directions and the cautions that are out there. Um, and they really don't pose a risk in that condition. The, the, the pre-emergent weed, the weed preventers, they stick and they adhere to the soil. You put that down as a brand new product, you water it in and it sticks and adheres to the soil. So it's not running off, it's not getting in any kind of water sources. And everything that I'm showing you today has the lowest risk rating is what they call caution rating. Uh, the fertilizers that I'm recommending here, these are slow release fertilizers. So they don't run off in the water, they stay where you place them. And again, with the, um, the herbicides, there's really no known risks with those, but you'll be following directions and you can limit your use and just spot treat here and there where the weeds are, or you can live with the weeds. Um, the real risk to uh, birds and wildlife comes more with the insecticides. Uh, and there's really, in my mind, no reason we need to be going down that road. Thanks, David. Um, so if someone's applying a pre-emergent now for um, weeds that are going to be growing later, will they need to reapply later in the spring or in the summer? Yes, and I, I forgot to show my, my little lawn calendar we give as a handout in the store. That's a really, really, really good point that I make all the time. So the, the preen crabgrass control I was showing you, for example, this is going to give you control for maybe 12 weeks. So let's pretend I put it down now, and I go April, May, June. By June, this is degraded and it's no longer effective. And then you start to see weeds cropping up as we go into July, August, September. And this is probably the number one complaint that I get. So first, uh, weeds are the number one complaint we get on lawns all the way. They've done surveys and that's weeds just drive people crazy. That's always the issue I focus on it. Um, so this stuff, it works well. It works very well, but about, you know, eight, 10 weeks out, you really do need to make a second application. So if I'm putting that down now, that's taking you to April, May, June. Um, sometime before the end of June, I need to make a second application to keep those weeds out for the remainder of the summer. Now that's gonna vary a little bit product to product, but that's, that's the way this particular one works. Thanks, David. All right, so our next question, we've had a few people write in about, they wanna know if you can use weed prevention a uh, weed killer and fertilizer at the same time? Yes, you can. Uh, these things can all be done together. In fact, we sell combination products. When you come into the store, it gets kind of confusing and overwhelming um, because what will happen is I'm showing you like, okay, here's a, a weed preventer. You can buy a weed preventer with a weed killer. You can buy weed preventer with a fertilizer. You can buy a weed preventer with a weed killer with a fertilizer. So we have these available in every imaginable combination. And we try to talk with you. And that's sort of what I'm doing now. There's no one answer for everybody uh, that's going to be out there. But some people, for example, they might 
need and want the convenience of, hey, I've got products that will, will prevent weeds, kill weeds, and fertilize all in one step. So it comes down to uh, what your goals, your objectives are, uh, and I'm sure we can find something that meets your needs. That's great. Thank you, David. All right, bouncing around. So we have more questions on weed killers. Some of them get pretty specific. So we're going to bounce to another topic for a second, and then we can come back later um, if we have time. Um, so the next question is about grubs. So they want to know how and when they can treat for grubs. Uh, so so grubs, I'm, I'm going to kind of take a, again, I'm going to use that as sort of a, a springboard into another issue or question. So grubs, right now, grubs are, they're, they're hibernating down the ground, right? They, they laid their eggs last July. Uh, those eggs hatch out and they're actively feeding, you know, through July, August, September, weather gets cold and they go down into winter and hibernate. So they're still three, four inches down in the ground sleeping. As it warms up, they'll begin, come closer up to the surface. And when they get up in that top one inch or so layer of the soil, then we can apply treatment, but that's not really going to happen probably until mid-April, early May time period. Okay, um, so that that's so there's not much we can do about grubs right now. Where I think that question might be coming from is I'm getting literally four or five calls a day, and have been since last year about wildlife digging up their grass. Um, uh, raccoons, skunks, possums, foxes, everybody's getting their lawns torn up. And historically that is associated with grubs. You say, oh, well, they're tearing the ground up searching for grubs. What's really going on right now, I think, is this is our year for the 17 year cicadas. So there have been, since 2004, their cicada larvae have been down there in the ground, slowly developing over the last 17 years. And last fall, they began to dig a little emergence tunnel. They're digging their little escape tunnel, like they're getting ready for the big prison break. And they come up and they're, and they're right under the surface. They're not actually going to emerge until things get warmer, so they're not coming out until May. But there are literally within the, like the whole region, four state, like three billion cicadas expected to come out this spring. So since last fall, we're getting raccoons and skunks and Possums and like I said, fox and everybody, these animals, they're digging into the ground, they're tearing up the ground, but they're not really searching for grubs. That's where I'm going with this. They're going after the cicada larvae that are in the ground, and we don't have a really great answer for this problem. Uh, what we've been doing, there's no, you, we can't treat this with insecticides. It's inappropriate and it's not going to work anyway. We've been trying with customers different repellents, just animal repellents. Um, and those can be helpful, but they're kind of a short term and based on the amount of rainfall we've been having, it's something that has to be repeat applied. But anyway, I know your question is about grubs, but I'm kind of guessing that the only reason somebody be asking today about grubs is if they're having their lawn torn up, and that's probably because of cicadas. That's my train of thought on that. That's interesting. And we've been getting a lot of questions on the cicadas across all of our classes. So that's definitely good to know. I know you, I know you've been getting questions about the cicadas. So, um, all right. So our next question is about uh, types of grass that you can grow under mature shade trees. Do you have any recommendations there? I do. So uh, there is no such thing as a shade loving grass, right? We always talked about shade tolerant. So we've got grasses that want to grow in the sun but the question is how much shade can you tolerate? So again, we custom blend our grass seed um, here and we have three different blends that we make available based on the situations that you're in. So this Merrifield Shady uh, is probably what's gonna be your best choice, but even the Merrifield Shady, which is our most shade tolerant blend, it really needs two or three hours of sun to sustain it. If you're putting this in total shade where we don't get any sun down to the ground, you're gonna seed it, it's gonna grow in, it's gonna die out, and then you're gonna reseed it, it's gonna grow in, it's gonna die out. You can't grow grass in total shade. But this is predominantly what's called hard fescue, fine fescue. It's your best choice for growing in those kind of conditions where you're competing with trees for sun, water, nutrients, this is a slow growing, uh, low management type of grass that's well adapted to that kind of conditions. So it's the best one that's out there, but you're gonna need 
uh, two or three hours of sunlight to really have it sustainable year to year. You can get started on this anytime now. If you go out and you seed your lawn today, it's not going to germinate right away. Uh, the soil temperature is still not warm enough. The grass seed doesn't really begin to germinate until our soil temperatures get to about 60 degrees. So you can go out and you can do your seeding now. And a lot of people are repairing patches and spotting, but you're not going to see anything grow for probably another month until we get into April. So just be aware of that. You're getting prepared, it's getting watered in, it's working its way into the ground, but don't be disappointed or don't get anxious um, for at least another month if you don't see it growing. Thanks, David. We actually had a question about whether or not now is a good time to seed. So that answers that. Um, we have a related question about seeding. If someone's seeding bare spots in their yard, can they do weed prevention at the same time? I am so glad you asked the question because that's where I wanted to go with this was um, with a caution, Kate. Okay. The weed control stuff I was talking about is not compatible with seeding. When we're on schedule, when things are working right, what we really want to do is in the fall, if you remember back to that chart, that September, October time period, when the soil's warm, we get quick germination, rapid establishment, temperatures are getting cooler, and we've got several months for that plant to develop a root system. So when things are on schedule, when things are right, we're doing our seeding and our establishment in fall, and then in spring, we're focused on our weed control. Uh, I also acknowledge, you know, life isn't always perfect that way. We get off schedule. So if you are in a situation where you need to seed, uh, you got bare spots, exposed soil, and you need to do your seeding, the weed controls, everything I just talked about is hands off for you because the same stuff that kills the weeds or prevents the seed from germinating will kill or prevent um, your grass seed. Now there's, there is a way out of this. Uh, that's the bag I forgot to bring up to the desk with me. There's a product um, that we sell. It's, it's, this is one product, it's very specific. It's made by Scott's and it's called um, Scott's Four Seeding. It's a starter fertilizer combined with a weed preventer that you can use at the same time as seeding. So it exists. This is a way out of this, especially product. I'd, I'd show it to you, but I forgot to bring it up here. Um, and, I, and I have to be really careful because if I say Scott step one for seeding, they make several different products. And if you get the wrong one, you're, you're not gonna be too successful. Um, but there is one that you can use a starter fertilizer combined with a weed preventer that you can use at the same time as seeding. So there's ways, there's always, we always have ways out of this, but that's not the standard off the shelf kind of thing. That's good to know. And if anybody needs to see that product after, I'm sure you guys are welcome to email us or send us a message and we can help you find that. Um, the next no, you just come straight to the store. Don't email me, don't call. You just come down come here. Come on and straight in and get it. That's always good too. <laughs> um, all right, so next question is about someone who is afraid that most of their lawn has is weeds. Um, so they're a little bit concerned that if they put down your weed preventer, uh, they may end up with nothing green growing at all. So in that case, would you recommend that they wait until the fall and do a proper lawn restoration or something like that? Or um, is there anything they can do now to help get their lawn growing grass again? Yeah, you know, I say we, we look at a glass, you know, being half empty, half full. Over the years, I've found a lot of times people come in, they just tell me, oh, I, if, I, if I kill weeds, I have nothing left. I don't have any grass at all. Um, I start looking at those pictures and say, no, it's not really that bad. You know, you have more grass than you realize. Uh, but I've seen those pictures too, where it's like, no, it really is that bad. So I like to begin by inviting you always to send us or even bring pictures in. Let's do a little bit of an evaluation to see if a total renovation is necessary. Uh, total renovations, like the worst case scenario, I really don't like to take that on in the summer. I'd much rather do that in the fall because if you undertake a total renovation now, the amount of time, money, and effort that you put into it is, is higher. And just like we said, we can do all that. Everything can be looking beautiful in May, and then you're watching your time, your money, and effort start to degrade and deteriorate as we go through the summer. And then you'll have to come back in and do some additional repair in, in the fall. So again, there's always ways to do this. It, it can be done. 
but I'd like to go through with you a little more time, more specifically, make sure that this is something that you're ready to undertake. Um, I would much prefer to be doing my renovations in the fall and just focusing on the weeds in the spring. Thanks, David. All right, our next question is about sod. Um, so if someone's putting down sod, is the care for their new sod any different than for their current grass or if they were seeding, um, do they still need to apply weed preventer? Um, are there any notes that you would give them about that? So again, thank you. These are things I keep forgetting to mention. Um, when we're talking about establishing growing from seed and spring seedings and spring renovation, sod solves all those problems. When you buy sod, you're buying grass that's already a year old. It takes at least nine months and most of our sods taking 12 months to grow. So when you buy a piece of sod, uh, somebody's done all this work for you, right? They, they got the seed going, they grew it in, they got the weeds out of it and you're buying picture perfect grass. So that, that solves all these problems I have with the seasonality and the weather and that kind of thing. It's just your costs went up. And so you have to kind of, again, manage that. So sod is a different scenario uh, because it's already a year old when you put it down. Within about a month's time, four to six weeks, it should be somewhat rooted into the ground, not fully established, but you know it will get roots established that quickly. Uh, you don't have near as many weed pressures and stuff, but uh, the only thing with sod is once you put it down, you have to keep it moist. Like I said, really that first six weeks or eight weeks is critical. Um, after that, you know, we still got to watch it during hot, dry spells, but uh, just keeping it moist because it, if it's young, it still has a shallow root system. Uh, you can pretty much after that first four to six weeks, you can go ahead and treat it as an established lawn. You can do your weed killers, your weed preventers, your fertilizers as needed. If it's new sod and it's great condition, and I'm just going to do the minimum care and maintenance on there, I'd say you probably still want to put a weed preventer on it because, like I said, that's an issue for everybody. But but beyond that, it should be in pretty good shape. Thanks, David. Um, all right, so we have a couple more questions and then I think guys will have some time to dive into a few more specifics on the weeds. So just those of you who ask questions about specific weeds in your lawn, I think we'll have some time to get to those. Um, I, mean, I intentionally didn't put much in here today because I just like talking to you guys. I, that's telling you, I'm just, me personally, I'm like sick to death of staring at screens and PowerPoint things and yeah. this best way. I just wanted to talk to you. So I didn't bring any set schedule in here. Oh yeah, this is fantastic. And I know we've got some good questions coming in about a lot of different weeds people are dealing with in their lawn. So I know people are glad to have time to get their questions addressed. Um, and yes, it's definitely nice to get a break from the standard PowerPoint. Um, all right, so here's a question, David, it's about lime. Um, can you tell us when is the best time to put lime down and it, it does rain affect the application of the product in any way? Okay, so lime, um... Lime can be applied at any time of year, except when the ground's frozen. So it can be done on new lawns, established lawns, um, just you know, whenever you have the time and effort to do it. Uh, lime is best if it gets watered in. So if you can time it before rain, like there's, like I saw 66% chance of rain tomorrow. So things like lime that need to go in the soil. Hey, if you're able to get it down today, get it raining tomorrow, that's ideal uh, that's in there. The thing with lime, uh, just kind of backing up a step, is we talk about with our soil chemistry, um, the pH of the soil, is the ground acidic or not? If your soil is very acidic, the minerals and the nutrients that are in there are not available to the plant. So the classic example, phosphorus, for example, phosphate is a, an essential nutrient for plants. They have to have it to grow and thrive. So you can have phosphorus in your soil, but if you're very acidic soil conditions, it's not mobile, the plant's not able to absorb it. So it's there, but it's not available to the plant. So on acidic soil conditions, we add lime to make those nutrients more available to plants. So it's really, it makes a big difference, significant difference in the healthier plant. I, I still remember, this is hundred years ago, uh, I was doing lawn service work. I you know, just graduated out of college. And I finally was talking to the, my boss about this and it kind of clicked with him. Yeah, you know, there was a year we just skipped our fall fertilization altogether. We just went out and added lime, added lime, the lawn screened up, made such a difference. Uh, 
but the question comes up, so how do I know if I need Lyme and how much I need? Uh, well, you, you really have to test the soil to know what the pH of it is. So we sell little do-it-yourself kits um, where you can just take some soil and some distilled water, shake it up, and you, you know, it's a little science project to see what color it turns. Those are surprisingly accurate. Um, I've done little tests. I mean, they're like a buck 69, a buck 99, and you get kind of on the spot results. Um, and I have a lot of faith in those. You can buy a probe that you go around, check yourself. They're not quite as reliable, um, but, but they're convenient. Um, or we also, at our plant clinics, we distribute the soil test kits where you can take a sample of soil from your yard package it up, you send it down to the university, they charge $10, but for that $10 fee, they do a complete analysis of your soil chemistry, the fertility, the pH levels, and they send you a report back of what needs to be done to optimize it. It takes about a week to get the results back. You know, if you're into this and you're willing to put that kind of effort into it, that would be ideal. So again, Lyme, we can do it really any time, but I really, really do like to have a pH test before making recommendations of how much to apply, or if you even need to apply it. Thanks, David. All right, so we've got time now, I think, to get into some more specific questions about weeds and that side sort of thing. So I'm gonna start jumping into some of those questions. Um, the first one is about crabgrass. Do you have any specific pre-emergence chemicals that you recommend to prevent crabgrass? So crabgrass, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, it was actually introduced to this country uh, as a forage crop. Uh, it's, I think it's Asian and, and parts of Europe where it originated. So we brought it to this country um, to use as forage for, for cows and horses, but it turns out it's really not very good for that. Uh, I think it's got low nutrient content and they don't really like it that much anyway, but of course it's been here and it's been kind of plaguing us ever since. So again, like they are saying, those seeds, they sit there in the soil, they start to lie dormant and when temperatures, soil temperatures start to get in the 50s, you'll get a little bit of seed germinating. But the thing you have to understand is that seed, let's say 5% or 10% of it starts to germinate in April. Another 10 or 20% of it's germinating in May. More of it starts germinating in June and it hits peak germination in July. It doesn't all sprout the same day. So you're absolutely right. You won't get ahead of it with a pre-emergent. Um, What's, what's in this product and several others, the active ingredient here, and, and this I almost, I hate talking about this stuff even before I bring it up. The chemical, the, the, the chemical name in here is called uh, dithiopure. And that has like no pizzazz, nobody can remember that or even wants to remember. So the manufacturers say, the marketing people get and say, oh, well, we're gonna call it dimension. Dimension is then sold on the open market and it can be put in 20 different products. So this, this product, the pre and crabgrass control uses a pre-emergent called Dimension. Um, you'll find it in other products if you look down in the fine print, but this is a very good one to use. You will need to do two applications a year because if you put it down now, and let's say March, April, it kind of fizzles out by the late summer and weeds come in. So I still like to do what we call split or a double application of this, but it's a very good one. It works on the crabgrass and it works on, like I said, about 25, 35 other common weeds. That's great. Um, what was the name of the product? I believe you showed that was to uh, kill winter weeds. Did you show a product for that? If not, do you have a recommendation? Sorry. I, I did. Now, again, there, there are choices. I don't, I don't, um, like to get locked in on a specific product, but I'm just showing good examples. So this particular one, um, which would be a good choice, is called Trimec Speed. The, the thing that happens is this has three different broadleaf weed killers. Um, Trimec is like a classic combination. It's been around for 50 years and everybody uses it. What they did with this particular one called Trimec Speed um, is they added a fourth ingredient that actually penetrates into the leaf as a contact herbicide, which makes it work faster. It works under cooler temperatures um, and it's more effective than some of the other products out there. So this is a very good one. 
Uh, it also means that the cost goes up a little bit with it. So that's where I say we talk to you one on one. And if you you may get some other recommendations, but this one from Gordon's Trimex Speed is excellent. It's also sold on the commercial name we have, which is called um, Speed Zone. So Speed Zone and Trimex Speed are the same thing. It's just Speed Zone is the commercial strength. Trimex Speed is the retail strength. Um, and it comes in all kinds of sizes. You know, I just, I tried the bigger one with the bigger label on there to see if that was helpful. Thank you, David. Um, all right, so next question is about Roundup. Um, this person says, Roundup is no longer permitted in my county for weed use. Can you recommend an alternative that may be as effective in handling weeds already coming in as well as preventing new ones later? I hear a lot about corn gluten, but I'm not sure of its effectiveness. So so um, where, where some of the uh, herbicides have been banned and things like, uh, you know, the Roundup has been banned there, there's there's a trade-off that goes there. There are some natural alternative products, but they just don't work as well. Uh, so in the past, if you used Roundup, which is Roundup is a non-selective herbicide, you spray it, it doesn't matter whether it's weeds, it's grass, it's flowers, you spray it on as a total kill. Uh, Roundup is absorbed into the leaf tissue and it systemically goes down and kills the roots and everything, which is one of the reasons it's so effective and so widely used. The alternative products, like we sell one that's called Burnout, for example. Burnout is also a non-selective weed killer. It's 100% organic. Um, you spray it on the plant, it dies, same as Roundup does. The difference is that the organic, the natural products, they don't get systemically absorbed into the plant. They don't get down into the root system. So if you have a persistent perennial weed, you spray it, it dies, but then it comes back from the roots. And so you just have to do this more frequently. Um, it's just a trade-off that's there um, it, it, that you're going to have to make. Corn gluten is an organic weed preventer. Um, it's been around for probably 25 years. It was university discovered and tested. You know, it's legit. I used it for about six or seven years myself to uh, just learn about it and practice with it. It's a byproduct of the cornmeal industry. So it's a food grade product. It's not even registered with the EPA because it's used as a food material. Uh, they, they found, um, interesting by a, a lab accident, that there's a protein in that corn gluten. And that protein basically works as a, as a, pre-emergent, a preventer. So again, it doesn't kill weeds, but when a seed is germinating, that little root starts to pop out from the uh, seed coat, comes in contact with that protein and it gets burned, it gets killed and prevents those weeds from establishing. So that is a natural alternative. I say it's a little bit early to plant that, I'd wait to use it, but as the soil temperatures start to warm up again, maybe two, three weeks from now, um, might be a good time to apply the corn gluten to prevent weeds from going in there. It also acts as a fertilizer because there's nitrogen in there that also greens up um, your, your, you can use also in gardens and lawn and garden. So we're tr simultaneously trying to increase the density of the grass while we suppress the weeds. It's completely pet and, pet and child safe products. So those are all the good things that go with it. The other side of that is it just doesn't give as effective a control as the chemicals. It's not going to last as long as sort of the conventional products do. Uh, and it's going to cost you more. But I, I make the analogy, it's like to me, if you're shopping at the grocer, you might go in and you might choose to buy organic food because just your principles, your values, your situation says, I want to buy organic food. And you're willing sometimes to pay a little bit of a premium for that. And also realize, hey, it may not, it may have a blemish or two on there. So we try to offer everything to everybody and help you through that. So, so yes, on corn gluten, uh, you can look at a product as uh, it's called Burnout. Uh, we also sell an organic lawn weed control uh, that's, that's made it with iron. It sells under a couple of names. We have one from Bone Hunt. It's called like Lawn Weed Killer FE or something. It's got that symbol FE on there. So we've got organic options for you, but they generally are going to cost a little bit more and not be quite as effective. But for many of you, that might be a really good route to go. 
Thank you so much, David. All right, it is 2.46. Um, so I wanna go ahead and make sure that we're closing on time. So if we weren't able to get to your question, please remember you're welcome to call the plant clinic, um, contact us at the store. Um, you can hit reply if you're on Zoom to email me, I can pass the information along. Or if you're on Facebook, please feel free to send us a message. Um, David, is there anything that you would like to close with before we wrap up? No, again, everybody, thanks for doing this. I know I enjoy the opportunity to come out and see everybody. Uh, just really enjoy the weather while it's here. I think it's supposed to get back a little dreary next week, um, but, but spring's on the way. Come and see us. We're getting plants in every day. Like I said, we've got these products. We've got, and I just can't emphasize, you've heard, I'm, I'm like one person, you know, of a much bigger team. So you come in, you're going to, we got great, great experienced people. So you come in anytime and we're here to help. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's a lot of people who would be happy to help at the stores. And um, I know I miss seeing you guys. So hopefully we'll be able to get up there soon. But you all um, have a good day. Everybody, again, please contact us or come into the store if you have questions. I know we're all looking forward to uh, spring arriving. Um, so everybody have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks.